Uh, Mayor, started here. Um, of course, we've already touched base on some of the stuff, but kind of give you an update on on where we are and, and what's going on in the world of, of drainage uh, throughout town. Uh, of course, haven't had to worry a whole lot about that this year, but uh, in years past, uh, had had some issues uh, out there. And so uh, I believe it was three years ago, three or four years ago, that uh, we added the drainage component into um, into our um, uh, into our priorities, and so as we as we went back and we looked at it, um, and took a took a look at our master drainage plan from 2000, uh, we had started some work in that. Of course, you know, drainage is one of those issues that uh, there's not any dedicated funding for that. It's uh, as we can find funding, um, either through if excess sales tax or whatever those what wherever those fundings come from or grant funds. Uh, that's when we uh, start working on drainage, and of course, as we are doing, going through our um, going through our street plans um, and and the bond projects and other projects, if we can incorporate those drainage improvements within those projects, we're doing it at that time. So, uh, as we as we look on here, some of our recent accomplishments were the East Angelo Drop Bell Street. We were able to uh, accommodate that within the Bell Street design, and so we were able to take care of that. And then also the Avenue P Detention Basin. Um, we were uh, again through grant funding and through uh, some stormwater funds and through um, actually some excess sales tax that had been set aside um, probably about eight or nine years ago. Uh, we were able to finish and complete this project, and so uh, working through that and, and and have got that done. We're also, of course, uh, we we talked about it a little bit ago um, uh, with the College Hills project. Uh, we're we're taking care of. Uh, some of the drainage issues there, and uh, we're not going to be able to completely solve all the problems, especially at the Arroyo. Uh, but uh, we are looking at uh, significant underground drainage, uh, getting that water underneath from the loop all the way to the south fork of the Red Arroyo, uh, getting that water off of the street. Uh, I believe the capacity that we have designed to or were able to design to would hold a 25-year event uh, underneath the street and so um, again that will help tremendously during rain events in the College Hills project and uh, of course you know we were looking at some other uh, getting designs ready we talked about the Foster Road project a while ago uh, trying to get something shelf ready for uh, in case we get some hazard mitigation grants and things like that as well too um, and of course uh, again we're uh, Continuing to, uh, and one of the other projects that we're working on that was identified in the original one currently is the lower crossing at Southwest by the McDonald's uh, in Councilman Miller's uh, uh, district. So we're working through that as well too as part of the road, road, road reconstruction project. And so we're trying, to, we're addressing some of these as we go, go along. So again, but it's, it's, it's a slow, uh, slow process. We did uh, work with uh, an engineering firm to update our 2000 master drainage plan, so uh, we did get that, we do have that updated. Uh, we ranked the top 36 problem areas around town. Uh, some of those were areas that we, um, that were identified separately uh, in the old plan that we combined and kind of created some new looks to them. Uh, and we went through that uh, and of course developed, uh, developed a plan for um, how a possible solution for 10 of those problems, the top 10 of those uh, areas and uh, got, um, got opinions of probable cost on what those uh, possible solutions would look like. Uh, estimate, uh, estimated $60 million um, to, in the opinion of probable cost for, uh, to get those um, to where, again, none of them are gonna be ever uh, completely 100% fixed, but again, to at least provide a lot of relief in those areas, uh, in those 10 areas, and of course, uh, again, no designated funding, but as we find those dollars, uh, whether that's through grants or other opportunities, we will uh, again try to address those. And as and if any of them are street related, as we as we address those streets, like we have in the past, we'll continue to to address those. So that's kind of a quick rundown on the drainage, and kind of moving into the streets. Uh, we we talked through this quite a bit a while ago, but just a little bit of history in 2015. Uh, we we um, worked with uh, Fugro, Fugro Roadwear Inc. Uh, to come in and do a con, uh, street condition survey for us. Uh, they uh, they surveyed every street in town. They gave us a, 
pavement condition index score for each street. And we worked with them to um, prioritize uh, our bond projects that we're working through right now. And they um, went through, the, you know, and it, it was a it was a process of looking at the condition of the of the road, the classification, whether it was an arterial or a collector, um, and then also our a average daily traffic as we worked through that. And so as we uh, went through that, we've got that done. Uh, with that, city council um, um, authorized uh, the funding of $80 million over 10 years. So every other year we're, uh, we're um, allocating $16 million in bond allocations to to our uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation projects, and, and we're going down that list. Uh, went through a lot of them a while ago. Uh, and then, of course, too, back then, Council did uh, increase our operation and maintenance budget uh, to uh, help us address the seal coating uh, program uh, to where we can, we're, we're touching a street, we're seal coating a street uh, at least once every eight years. And so uh, to actually start a, a more robust maintenance program than what we'd had in the past. And then we do, uh, we set aside about a half a million dollars a year for a crack sealing program, pothole repair, small constructions, uh, alley maintenance, those type of things is, is kind of where we set aside our, uh, the funding for that as well. And um, the study, the Fugro study that was done in 2015, obviously we've had a lot of development and a lot of construction going on since 2015. Is there anything in that 2015 prioritization prioritization of those streets, is there anything that's changed that you think needed to be moved up or moved down based off of new traffic flow or traffic patterns based off of construction and development? Right now we're, the streets, the majority of the streets are in the prioritization list, I, I believe still, still are deserving to be where they're at. Uh, with the new development, we haven't seen a lot of actual traffic movement. Um, I think there, there could be some things in the future that happen that, that could cause some movement of traffic. Uh, but currently right now our traffic patterns are remaining relatively steady other than we are building a lot of new residential roads. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of new arterials or collectors coming in. And so that's where you're going to see the majority of your heavy traffic and your deterioration taking place. And so I think right now the, the, the existing path that we're on is uh, is still a very viable path, so I, I think we're I think we're still heading in the right direction with that. Um, just a quick recap again: uh, completed projects, MLK Boulevard, uh, the Southland by the Sam's Club, College Hills um, uh, south of Loop 306 to Valley View uh, has been redone, West Concho Avenue. And then, of course, Bell Street is completed, active projects, Southwest Boulevard, uh, the Chadburn Street downtown, uh, Real Concho Drive, and College Hills Boulevard has just started. It's just underway with the utility portion right now. Uh, coming up soon, we have the Chadburn Street downtown phase two. Uh, of course, we talked about this a while ago, the North Chadburn from basically the railroad tracks uh, there at Fifth Street all the way to 43rd. Howard Street, uh, again, and uh, getting close to final design. Edma, Edmund, Glenn, and 29th, uh, kind of midway through design. Sunset, uh, just now fixing to get started on that one in design phase. And then Cristobal Road, uh, you will be seeing uh, an item on this next council meeting to authorize the design of Cristobal Road. Uh, looking at, uh, also looking at to apply for a DSIP grant uh, for that uh, Cristobal Road project as well, too. So. Uh, that uh, we'll have that uh, coming uh, also before you at this next council meeting to apply question. for that grant. Yes, Tommy. Quick, quick question, Shane. Um, on the Christopher Road, is that from Chadburn Avenue L, or is that Avenue L all the way out to where it hooks up with uh, 270 or with 87? What is this this portion is from Chadburn to Avenue L. Okay, uh, that's the portion of, that the city owns from Chadburn to 87. Um, 277 is uh, still belongs to the state, State Loop 378, and the state is currently, uh, they're, they're planning on letting that bid for reconstruction in September. So uh, at some point that will that will be widened and reconstructed from Chad, South Chadron to 277. As a part of the project, will uh, any, any kind of curbing be done on Christopher Road, Chadron Avenue L? Some, some of it does not have 
Cur- curbing, curbing gutter. Cur- in the, cur- curbing gutter of any sort. That will be part of the, de- in the design phase, we will be working with the uh, engin- engineering design firm to determine uh, from the drainage aspect of it, because there are quite a few drainage issues in that area as well, right. too, uh, probably needing to, to widen the road in certain areas. And then, of course, add, uh, we're looking at adding uh, some um, uh, shared use pedestrian pathways um, along that s- segment as well, too. Um, and so when we look at that, some of that will require curbing gutter, some of it may not, uh, but there, more than likely we will see some uh, new curbing gutter going in it. I was there. just thinking, you know, may it ex- greatly extend the life of the roadway, obviously, if it wasn't raveling on the edges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Tom, you had some questions. So, Shane, you talk a lot about some is city property, some is county property, some is state property. Do we have any input on where the state prioritizes what they do next? Uh, through our MPO, uh, uh, the MPO board that we have, uh, we do work closely with TxDOT in that group to, uh, they actually, we identify areas that uh, in the state. You campaign that, them together and make sure we're all on Yes, the same we're all on the same page and we're all heading in the same direction. We meet so, every other month and each of those streets or projects is discussed, funding is moved around if for some reason something becomes like need to do it. So you'll get some phone calls sometime and there's like that state property that's not ours. Yes. But similar to me and Patrick had an issue with a, a sign inside the city limits. But anyway, you answered my question. Thanks, Shane. And, and maintenance and there and we don't necessarily on their maintenance dollars. We don't have a lot of input on their maintenance dollars, but a lot of their construction or and or some sometimes their reconstruction. Uh, we do have quite a bit of input as well through the MPO. So for the questions on it for Shane at this point from any other council member all right keep going okay and then just briefly uh, you know we, we did touch base on some of those the year 10 projects they're not on this list but we did touch base um, uh, on those in in our previous CIP discussion as well too so just to let uh, let y'all know there and so uh, kind of changing uh, that's kind of the quick update for the drainage quick update on the streets and kind of where we are and what we're going of course we did we talked about the the silk coat uh, that we're going to have come up again this year so we talked about that already so uh, one thing that we wanted to bring up today is funding sources if, if you'll remember council uh, for the last several years uh, we've we've talked about you know the importance of streets and the infrastructure and and trying to address it and how we're going to address it and so and council has um, has done a, uh, an amazing job uh, of, uh, of working with staff to get us the funding that we need to really get started and really get working on it. Of course, uh, you know, I know that each of y'all, because um, y'all in turn will call and visit with us, y'all are, you know, continuously getting phone calls from citizens about streets and, and prioritizing streets and, and, and trying to move, move this forward and, and move our street program forward. And of course, we uh, we as staff want to be uh, we'd much rather be proactive in this than reactive. And so, uh, for years and years, I mean, we we've kind of been in reactive mode, and, and we're wanting to switch that into a proactive mode. And so, as we're moving forward, you know, we want to talk about funding. And and I think council has given us that direction in the past to to look for alternative ways uh, to fund things. And so we have we've gone out there and we and we've looked at multiple options and things like that. And uh, you know, currently, when we look at our current funding sources, uh, we have the bond bond project. Of course, we're fixing a bond, um, uh, the fourth of the f- uh, out of five uh, of our bond projects. And so, we'll have this one in two years. We'll have the last one. And so, you know, within the next four years, we're going to kind of that's going to kind of be on the downhill slide of, of all the projects being completed and coming to completion. Um, and then, you know, we do have our O and our annual O and M maintenance that we use for maintenance for the Silco program and, and for uh, da- other daily activities. And and then we did City Council last year um, in last budget uh, adopted the um, uh, was it point oh oh six is that what you said Tina uh, out of the out of that and dedicated that out of um, out of the property tax. Um, for funding for the streets and so that's kind of where we are right now from a from a a funding standpoint right now and how we're funding and how we're moving forward we have established a strategy for doing the major streets and then some of the artillery streets so there is a game plan and a time frame as just you proposed 
almost um, 448 million dollars worth uh, of lots projects and lots that are of out ways, there. So we have spent a tremendous amount of money on streets over the past four years. We've made it a key priority. Yep. We have made that a priority that says if we have money, we're going to give it to streets first because that has been one of the biggest issues that, that citizens have had with the city is the sure. lack of maintaining our streets. And so we have made that a key priority. And the and the you know and again we're it, it has been a priority and 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 city council has really stepped up and, and and worked with staff to try to find those funds so we can move move forward as we're going on and of course uh, the one thing that we do are the are the grants that we're looking looking at you know we've been we've been working uh, quite a bit with TxDOT here recently um, in our. Um, uh, in the in their safety program, their road to zero program, and some of that stuff, we're looking at uh, some signalization upgrades. Uh, of course, mostly that's on system uh, with TxDOT, but again, uh, we are responsible here in town for the maintenance of those uh, of those structures and those lights. And so, but working with them in that project as well from grants, uh, we're also um, we've been uh, webinar after webinar after webinar. Uh, about the uh, infrastructure bill that's come down from the federal government, and so again, we believe the grant granting opportunities are going to become more viable as we uh, move into the next three or four or five years. And so, uh, really, kind of working through working through those and making sure that we do have ma the matching funds that it's going to take and require uh, to to get those grants as we move forward. So, but again, it just makes our local dollars go that much further when we can when we can get that influx of, of federal dollars uh, with it. And, and we talked last year, if y'all will remember last year when we were at the strategic planning meeting, we brought, we brought a, a, an idea uh, to city council for a street use fee. Um, and so as we, as we did that and we looked at, the, and we looked at that uh, last year and we talked through it kind of in a very high level uh, to look at the proposed street use fee, um, you know, council, council gave staff direction uh, to kind of delve into it a little bit further and, and see what that could look like for the city of San Angelo and 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 what that uh, and what that could possibly be, and so we did that and so we have we have uh, we engaged Kimley Horn, an engineering uh, design firm uh, or an engineering firm that that has specialized well no, I don't say specialized but they have done done several of these and worked with several other um, uh, municipalities around to to establish these street use fees. Uh, here are some of the examples of the other other cities, somewhat similar size, some smaller, uh, definitely like Snyder, uh, and then of course Corpus Christi and some of those that are much bigger. And but as we look at them, uh, there, so there, it's it's kind of across the board is the is, is what the cities are doing and what they're uh, and how they're uh, starting to engage in these type of street use fees. Um, and the one that uh, we kind of uh, we looked at. Uh, fairly closely was Abilene, uh, and, and we brought that to y'all's attention last year. Um, Abilene is the one that uh, is probably the closest to, to not only, you know, and I guess in a uh, physical relationship, but also in size and, and kind of how they're set up and how they work. And so we looked at theirs, uh, we looked at their program that they initiated um, and, and, and have visited with them and talked to them about the successes that they are seeing with their program. Uh, and basically, they used theirs as a, uh, to get started in the maintenance as to where uh, our city council had, uh, had stepped up several years before that with our maintenance program. And so Abilene is using theirs as a maintenance program, but they've, uh, uh, they have seen that as such a success that they're actually looking to maybe want to expand their program into more of a, uh, to expand it to start addressing uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction of their roadways as well too, not just maintenance. So. Uh, as we look at that, you know, we're we're seeing we're seeing other communities that are uh, that have that have implemented this and and are seeing definite benefits across uh, across their cities as they move forward. Um, you know, and, and kind of going through it and kind of some of the benefits that we see uh, from city staff as we're looking at it. You know, uh, you know, it continues to to provide that funding. You know, we're, we're know we're going to get to the end of the bond funding before long, and then trying to figure out you know what's that next step then and and so and how are we going to continue this program and try to get on the proactive side instead of the reactive side of street construction and street maintenance 
And as we look at it, you know, one, you know, one of the things that city council has been adamant on is not increasing property tax. And so we do not want to increase the property tax. And so as well, and, and I mean, that's from, you know, uh, uh, not only, you know, when, you know, the economic development guys and, and guy and his bunch when they're going out and Michael Looney and his bunch when they're going out and trying to bring businesses in, you know, uh, if, if, if businesses are seeing your property taxes increase, 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 you know, they're not going to be enticed or want to come to town. And so, again, there's multiple reasons for, for not increasing the property tax, tax rate uh, to address this as well. And two, and, you know, there are concerns about how much debt you know, we're adding to our books and we don't want to continue to keep adding debt. So this fee would be one way, one possible way not to do that, not to add debt, not to increase your property tax rate. And as you're going through the, um, you know, and, and some of the things that we could do with these funding um, that's possible, you know, kind of how we set up right now, council's kind of said somewhere between four and five million is kind of would be a target for us to look at. And so that's kind of the target that we've worked through. And Patrick here in a minute is going to kind of go through the inner workings of how this, how it would work and how it would look. Uh, but as we're going through this and we're looking, you know, one of our thoughts is to bring in an a in-house mill and overlay crew. If we're going to actually get out, I mean, because we cannot, I don't believe, my, it's my personal opinion, I do not believe that we could ever borrow enough money to address every street in town. Uh, but if we start bringing some of this in-house and we can start directing it in-house, and I believe we can do this, a lot of this work, especially the rehabilitation portion of it, I believe we can do a lot of that in-house at a lower cost and more efficiently. Um, and bringing that in-house will also give us flexibility to go where we need to go, when we need to go, versus being tied to a contract. Uh, that being said, there are going to be those things that we are not going to be able to do in-house. Uh, Reconstruction, full depth reconstruction, uh, or the, the FDR process that, we, that we're doing out here on Bell Street. Those are things uh, when roads have failed, we're not going to be able to rehabilitate those. So this money could also be pay as you go capital to contract out some of those services that we're still not going to be on it or we're not going to be able to do in house. And then also when we're looking at it, uh, being able to, one, possibly as we're looking at these granting opportunities, give us a source for. Uh, match money for these grants uh, because a lot of these grants that are going to come out are going to be 80-20 matches or 70-30 matches and, and we are going to have to have dollars here in the city for us to be able to take advantage of those grant dollars so again it does that and then two with the street use it, it, it is it's 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 based on um, trip it's based on a trip factor and trip generators and so when you apply it in that manner across the board. It's, it's equitable across all land uses, all business types, and, and all sectors of the community. So when you look at it from that, it's a more equitable way of putting or, or basically acquiring the funding you need to take care of the degradation of the pavement, you know, based on how much it's, you know, the, 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 how much money you're generating will be based off your trip generation. How many, if you're a business, how many, you know, and, and Patrick will go through the details here in just a second, just kind of a high level view here. But uh, if your business, you know, typically generates, you know, 5,000 trips a day, you're, you know, you're going to be paying more than somebody that, you know, only generates five trips a day. So, again, it, again, it's, it's the, 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 the trip generation and the degradation of the payments kind of, it's kind of linear in how, how it's set up and designed. And so as we move across, we will uh, let Patrick kind of chime in here and start and kind of go through uh, the details of how this program would work. Let's, let's stop right now and just see if council has any questions that they want to ask at this point in the presentation um, before Patrick takes over. Oh, please, yeah. <clears throat> I don't fundamentally disagree with this concept, and I don't think anyone else up here does, although I won't speak for them. But I think that the elephant in the room is that the community needs to be, be brought along slowly on any kind of cost increase, especially right on the heels of their tax bills. So uh, I think my concern is one of timing, and I just want to put that out there. 
so that it's part of the conversation. I don't know how we address that. I don't know if it's a town hall, but I think that council uh, needs to hear what the public has to say about this. And of course, we all understand that the amount that will be added potentially to our bills is the cost of a hamburger and a Coke, but it, there's something about uh, the fact that it's news right now after news that was startling to a lot of people. Yes, ma'am. And, and again, this is, we're bringing this just as a proposal, uh, and, and it, was, it was something we've been asked to look at over time. Again, you presented it last year yes, as I did. part of our strategic planning, and it was at that point in time we said just continue to pursue it, so meaning we don't have enough information to start immediately, but continue to pursue it. And the other issue, which you can address in a minute, and when you get through with this, is somehow because it's proposed that it would be on the water bill, everybody thinks it's water increases. Just as people look at that water bill and think it's expensive water, but what it is, it's many things on that water bill because it's the water, it's the sewer, it's the trash, and it's storm water. And so the reason for using the water bill as the means of which to charge folks, if you will, can you explain that and the reason behind that? Yes, ma'am. We, we, well, well, we can touch on it here in a minute. We have a, it kind of Whenever more towards the end of the process. Okay. And, and we can address that, but again, it, it does. It's uh, one, the utility bill is already established. We're, it's already an established uh, means by which we send out a bill every month instead of creating you know, four bills or five bills that we're sending out, we just put all the utilities that we charge on one statement. So it's ease of that. And then also, if if there if 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 you if it's not set up correctly, there's no way to um, there's no way to I'm trying to think um, there's Identify. no way to no way to collect uh, to collect on that in, in such a manner that it's um, enforceable basically. And so again, we have to have that set up in the way we do it. And again, there again, there is no specific time or nothing. We're just bringing this forward for council for council to look at, for give us feedback. Is it good? Is it bad? I mean, do you do you not like how it's set up or the way it's set up? And so again, we're just trying to garner feedback right now, not necessarily try to, uh, you know. It, and we're it, not it taking a itself. vote today. This That's is correct. a presentation only an opportunity to learn more, to ask the questions, so that you can answer your constituents' issues or challenges or uh, explain it better. So use this as a learning situation for all of us. And, and, we, and, and again, we, we'll kind of go through some more things. And we definitely do need council's feedback on some of these items as well, too, because again, we're we're still we're not at we're not at the we're not at the final stages of this we're still we're still kind of mid level, uh, working through the details and so again we need to get council feedback and work our way through. Harry, um, do you have a question or comment? I just have a comment, uh, and that is, I think the proposed uh, direction that we're going with this, if we decide to do this, has a lot of benefits. First of all, we can we can put some city employees back to, on the roads, doing what streets, doing what we, what I think we can do from a maintenance standpoint and small reconstruction that will save the taxpayers dollars in the long run. And so from my perspective, this investment, I think will pay benefits. So I think the concept, whether we stay with 675 or some of those other numbers is, is, is is not anything I'm worried about discussing today. But I think the concept will ultimately save taxpayer dollars, and so I think it's a good concept. Lucy? I just have a quick question. Uh, Shane, how did you come up with 675? We based a lot of what we did off of other cities' numbers that we were that uh, not only we looked at, but also our consultant looked at. And so these numbers are based a, a, a lot on what other cities are doing. So, uh, and again, some of them are tweaked a little bit. Some of our numbers are tweaked a little bit to kind of work for the city and kind of what council's target number was for us to look at. And so some of those numbers are tweaked. But again, we based a lot of this stuff on what other cities have already done and established. And you said Abilene was already doing this. Correct. Okay. And that, that all those list of cities I had up on the screen, yes, are currently in the and program question is and how how much money are they bringing in say for instance just Abilene 
per year. I believe it. I believe it. Ever long they've been doing it. I think their dollar amount per person is larger than this proposal, but I think six to seven million. Abilene's bringing in right at five million, just over five million on their, with their fee. And again, theirs is for maintenance activities, so their chip seal and stuff like that. So that's what they're bringing in. But, and, and again, as we kind of go through the workings of kind of how we have it laid out and based on based on input from our consultant that we worked with, uh, and again, based on what, again, what we saw in other cities, because Abilene, I believe, is 675, is that where Abilene? 675 is yeah. exactly where they're and, at. And so uh, that's exactly where they're at in, in other cities. And every city has their own nuances to their program. And so you kind of, you kind of define your program based on the needs of your city and, and how their city councils wanted it set up, so. They instituted it about three years ago and they've gone back and they're updating it and going back for, I think, larger dollars and more comprehensive thing. So they're on their second round of implementing a change to it, something like that. Yep, they're, they're, they're starting to look, again, as I mentioned earlier, they, they, they've had, or they feel they've had such success that with this program that they want to actually expand the program that they have into a re rehabilitation uh, and reconstruction program as well, a lot like what we were starting to do with our bond funding. And so, um, and, and again, but I think as we start looking at some of these, uh, like um, uh, Harry stated just a minute ago, uh, you know, bringing some of these, these things back in house and doing some of those maintenance activities that we can do in house, um, you know, just looking at what four to five million dollars a year could do somewhere in that range. Um, I, I think of it, I, you know, I think of it in individual streets and not everybody may be familiar with the street. But if you look at um, look at Avenue L or Avenue J, one of those type streets and uh, that act as a minor collector uh, in the Santa Rita neighborhood, if you look at something like that, you know, if we do brought an in-house crew kind of with those kind of funds available, you know, we could probably see doing an entire street section like that four or five times over in a year. So you're starting to see some of those minor collectors and some of those smaller roads within our within our neighborhoods that handle a lot of daily traffic to where we can improve those. We could do improvements in-house, uh, and, and again, we could do a lot more. And again, the flexibility of it is, is what I think is so key to that, so. I think the toughest not to correct to crack on this is equitability. And I assume you're taking you know, some information from Abilene on how you divide up this pie so that uh, the public feels as though it's done fairly across the board. I'd suspect that the next meeting we have and people are talking about that in public, that's where we're gonna get some important inputs about how they think this ought to be handled in terms of who's paying what. Yes, and, and Patrick's fixing to get into that, so and, and it'll kind of show and break down how, how all that works. And so I'll let Patrick take it away. Right, so after our strategic planning workshop last year, we did engage with Kimley Horn, like Shane was talking about, and started to develop a fee structure that was something that for San Angelo and, and how our uniqueness. Um, so what they developed was a structure that basically had two categories. You had a residential category and you had a non-residential category. So on your screen there, you're looking at the residential side of the, of the pie here. So for a single family residential, which is a typical home, you'd be looking at a, at a flat rate of $6.75 per month. On the other side, there's multifamily as part of that residential. And so you're talking about apartment complexes, townhomes, duplexes in that category. And, and what the consultants proposed was $6 per dwelling unit on that. So if an apartment complex has 100 apartments, it'd be six times 100 per month for that particular apartment complex. So that's the residential side. So the residential side is very, very easy and easy to understand. But for non-residential, what we didn't want to do is just propose a flat fixed rate for, for resi like we did on residential properties because the sheer range of different properties and commercial entities in San Angelo uh, just warranted a range of categories and fee structures as well on that. So um, along with that, there's a calculation that we used in order to determine exactly what fee a particular entity would be charged. So based, starting with that, we 
we reached back to a nationally published manual, the Institute of Traffic Engineers Trip Generation Manual. That's a big name and it's a big book. So basically what that book does is it goes in and it categorizes every type of business in the United States. And for each of that type of business, they generally tag a number in there for the amount of trips that that particular uh, business type would generate. And so as the easy way to, to understand this is to walk through an example with you. And so that's kind of what we have on our screen. So let me kind of talk you through how that, that equation plays out. So if you look at a particular en entity and, and we start with the business classification. So in this case, we're looking at like a restaurant, a gym, a salon, something like that. So you see there's a gym up there. And that is then classified into a land use category that is stemmed from that, IT, that ITE manual. The land use category, again, um, goes takes it from a gym to a health or fitness club. From there, that land use category within that same manual, you have a development unit. So for each land use category, there's a, there's a multiplier or development unit in there. So whether that's square footage, whether that's number of acres, whether that's number of fueling items, whatever that particular business classification is in its, in its niche, that has a, a particular development unit. So in the case of a gym, it's based on per square feet. So per thousand square feet, you have a trip factor. And so that's the number of trips that's generated per thousand square feet for that particular gym. So if you do the math kind of there, for example, a 3,000 square foot gym classified as an athletic club, 3,000 divided by the thousand, thousand per square feet gives you three times the trip factor, 4.52, gives you a, multiple, a, a sum of 13.56. So then you move over into that fee schedule over there, and there's a there's a range there between the 10 and 15 that that 13.56 falls within, classified as a C3, which ultimately is $45 there. Now there's a table all the way to the right there that kind of that we use that the the uh, consultants came up with as a way to expand that into the the larger entities. So you're really talking about your higher use category. So if we didn't have the multiplier, you're looking at a $75 max fee as proposed right now. But what that multiplier does is you take it and anything between, as it's shown on the screen there, zero and three, or zero and 300 would be multiplied by one. Between 300 and 600 would be multiplied by two. So $75, $150, $225 is kind of how that plays out. Based on what the consultants came up with, when they looked at San Angelo, they took the tens of thousands of different business types that are in this manual, and they pared down that down to 46 land use categories that basically encompass almost every business entity in San Angelo. So every non-residential entity would be classified underneath one of these 46 um, land use categories that the, that the consultants proposed. So moving on to that, these are the rates that, that were proposed initially by them. Um, what you see there is you see your you have your residential at six and six point seven five and six. They're at the bottom, and then in the non-residential categories, there's basically six tiers there ranging from $25 to $75. That multiplier table off to the right. Um, and ultimately, there's an annual uh, revenue generation under these proposed rates of about four and a half million dollars. If you look at the residential generation, obviously, it, it would be interesting to know what kind of the numbers are behind it. So if you look for each one of those tiers in each one of those categories, the number of customers, the proposed rate there, kind of what a monthly and an annual revenue would be for each tier. Uh, and then we, we as staff wanted to kind of give counsel an insight into if we wanted to discuss um, or if they wanted to look at adjusting those rates in some manner, kind of what a dollar would do on the residential side and what five dollars would do on the non-residential side. Whether that's increasing by a dollar or decreasing a dollar, that would be a plus or minus both monthly and annually there in that far right column. 
There were three entities that the consultants carved out um, as far as land, large land use categories um, based on San Angelo specifically. The airport, Goodfellow Air Force Base, and the San Angelo Stock Show and Rodeo Association. So based on a, a calculation and a methodology that they had come up with for those three entities, those would be billed on an annual basis at $3,500 per month, $3,000 and $1,050 respectively as proposed. Talk about those because of the large land mass that they are. My, if you'll go back to that, the question mark is, okay, so how would that compare to, for example, um, the uh, school, SISD, as well as Angelo State University, because they too would be considered large yes, we'll, land. Yes, ma'am. We'll, uh, we have a slide further on where we're, we'll visit with, with y'all to try to get some feedback from y'all on those. Because uh, the schools, they look at the schools a little differently. Uh, and so most, well, almost all of them ha charge like a per student, on a per student basis. Uh, and so again, uh, we will look at uh, that in a few more slides. <coughs> Sorry. The reason some of that would become an issue is because if you take a look at um, elementary school and middle schools, they don't drive, those students. No, ma'am, but their parents do. Their parents do, but so that's the reason I asked too, is if you start taking and breaking it down into thought processes, those would be some of the things that you mm -hmm. would ask yes, or think about. And again, that's why we, we're looking at this as not necessarily individuals, but looking at it as based on trip generation. Uh, and, and that's the key to this is the trip generation and, and what does that entity or what does that school or or whatever it is, what what do they, how many, what is their trip generation look like? And so, uh, again, that's, that's how we're basing this on. And so, um, because whether it's an elementary school or a junior high, even though those children aren't driving, um, if, if y'all have been around one of the schools at drop-off time or pick-up time, it's, uh, it's amazing <laughs> how, how many vehicles are out there to pick up the kids. And so, and of course, and then the bus is also traveling on the roads as well too, uh, again, generating that degradation of the pavement, so. <coughs> and so some of the other components that we looked at in this, and of course we want council's feedback on this, uh, are, are some of these things, you know, and, and just to kind of let you know, we are going to create a grievance process for this, not necessarily the, about what it is or how much it is, that's a council decision, but again, when we look at, um, uh, as from staff and or our consultants, we do not necessarily know, um, just going to, Mayor, we don't know what Brenda Gunter Inc. is. Uh, and so uh, it's not descriptive, and so we don't necessarily know what land use category to put that in. And so we are going to have those where we're going to have people come say, hey, I'm not in this group. I need to be in this group. Um, and so a lot of those, and so that's what the grievance process is for, is so they can come tell us that, hey, I, I don't belong down here in this one. I belong up here in this one. And so we'll do that. And, of course, most of these uh, it, it will be resolved at the department review level. And so, but if it, if it escalates above that, we, we are going to have the city auditor review it and provide feedback and, and guidance there. And if that is still unsatisfactory to, to, the, to the citizen or the business, then we would have the city manager as the final, um, uh, final process in the review uh, of that. And so to, to do it. Uh, again, we believe that, uh, we believe that uh, almost all, if I, I, can't, I can't see that, uh, you know, once we, once we get to know what the business is and how it acts and what it looks like and base, base it on that information that we receive, I don't know why it would ever have to escalate beyond the department review. But again, just in case it does, there is a process in place. Um, also want to really uh, emphasize this is that this these monies would be in a separate fund and they would be restricted to basically the rehabilitation reconstruction and maintenance of roadway elements and those elements are you know the road base the road itself curb and gutter sidewalks uh, traffic signals uh, pedestrian elements all of those things would would and that's all that these funds could be used for they couldn't be used 
in water. They can't be used in uh, general services. They can't be used anything but on the streets themselves. And so, which the other issue that I think we should emphasize here is that that would also not change, and we wouldn't eliminate the dollars that's in operations and or the funds that we already put into street construction. As we said, seal coatings, three point five million five hundred thousand for potholes, et cetera. So we're saying that we would continue funding those as they're funding. So let's say we would put $4 million into the budget for like we have been doing, right? Correct. So we're not taking that away. What we're doing is adding this would be an to addition this to, in addition correct, to it so that we could do it faster, quicker, more efficiently, and less costly. Correct. And and we would and we would not mingle these these funds these dedicated funds we would not mingle these with our <laughs> traditional operation and maintenance funds they would still remain separate and so the accounting and the uh, the accountability would be there that we are using these funds where they're supposed to be used which is on the streets and so I want to you know wanted to make sure that everybody understands that that that, that there will be no commingling of of of, of uh, this fund with any of the other ones as well too so uh, and then again as we visited about earlier signing it to the existing utility bill uh, again to, to help with that enforcement in the collection of, of the bill um, again it, it gives it gives the city ability to to actually collect and also work through our collection system that we have with the utility statement uh, some of the things uh, as we that we need to consider as we're looking at this uh, is as we look into the future, we all know, uh, you know, uh, that um, everything, the cost of doing business goes up yearly. Uh, and here lately, it's been going up exponentially. Our dollars don't go as far as they used to. So at some time in the future, uh, if y'all decide to implement a program like this, uh, one of the things we would know is kind of what would you want to look at from an escalation period? Would we want to, uh, you know, staff would recommend doing it on a percentage basis, uh, and whether we base that on some consumer pricing index, a, uh, a municipal price index or cost index, something or one that's related to actual road maintenance itself, um, one of the indices um, that are out there with a percentage cap on top of that, would we want to look at something like that? Would we just want a fixed annual rate um, at some, whatever that is, at two and a half, three percent, whatever it is, kind of what we would consider a general inflation rate? Um, and then also, you know, would you want to start that type of uh, rate escalation year two, year three, year four, year five? How far out would you want to take the program before we actually started looking at increasing this fee to accommodate for um, uh, for that um, for the, basically the inflation uh, that that we know we're going to see over time. So that's something to consider as we looking into this and 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 hope to get feedback at some point. Um, another thing that staff would recommend is also for a low low income accommodation uh, is to utilize what we're using in with our water utility currently. Uh, is, is adding funding into the low, low income assistance program through the Concho Valley Action Agency. Um, and that way, if people are having problems paying their bills or, or covering their bills or the cost of this, is that they can seek uh, assistance uh, that, that, uh, from this agency that, that works with, with low income people on a, on a regular basis to help them pay their bills. And so we would recommend that as well. Again, would like y'all's feedback on that as well, too. Uh, one of the things that we that we wanted to bring to your attention is the apartments. Uh, when you look at um, when you look at this, when you look at apartments, when you have 100 units or 200 units or 250 units times six dollars, that that starts becoming very burdensome on, up front. Um, and you know, a lot of those apartments uh, and people like that, you know, they're in con you know they're in six month or year long contracts. And so they're locked in. And so for them to absorb that cost all at once um, would be considerable. And, and so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we would, as staff, recommend a phased approach to where maybe we do 50 percent uh, year one and then 100 percent year two to allow them to build into their contracts as those contracts come up for renewal uh, to help cover those costs uh, on the apartments as well, too. 
And then finally, when we start talking about schools, um, and again, we look at schools, SASD, TLC, Cornerstone, ASU, Howard, et cetera, uh, all of the schools. Uh, when we look at that, most, every, mo most everyone else is, is charging a per student basis instead of a, a flat per campus or whatever, because every, everything and everybody varies and so by size. And so they, they've looked at a per student basis. And so when we looked at this, kind of to give y'all, um, basically let y'all look at this and kind of give us direction as to what y'all feel is appropriate uh, for schools. We looked at anywhere from 60 cents per student to $1.15 per student, and you can kind of see what the uh, annual generation, revenue generation would be for uh, for that. And this is based on Snagelo ISD's uh, enrollment numbers this last year. So that's kind of what, uh, for Snagelo ISD, that's kind of what this would look at. And, and when we look at that, you know, these type of dollars, those are pretty significant for somebody to immediately absorb into a budget. And so we would also uh, recommend a phased approach uh, for our schools uh, out there as well too. Um, you know, 50% year one, 100% year two. Uh, if council has other ideas, we would love to hear those as well too. But again, to allow these schools and, and people time to build this fee into their budgets. Uh, because again, it's, uh, that's a pretty sub substantial uh, dollar figure just to all of a sudden be plugging into a budget one day especially if they're on a different fiscal um, time frame than we are as well. And with that, I think that kind of wraps up the, um, the funding and the, and the fee proposal. So again, we would love, love y'all's feedback and any questions, comments. And I'll start we'll with Larry. Do you have questions or comments for them? So are there any entities that are exempt from this? As it currently stands, Larry, no, we're not proposing any entities that are exempt per se, but again, that's at council's discretion and, and um, consideration. So we would look for that feedback from council, but these numbers are taking into account all residential and non-residential non entities currently. That, incl that includes the city. I mean, right. uh, the city departments or city entities, we would all uh, within the, our different funds would, would also contribute to this as well too, because um, uh, we are trip generators as well. Karen? The implication is that this does not require voter approval. Can you speak to that, please? No, ma'am, this does not require voter, voter approval. This can, be, um, this can be adopted as an ordinance by city council. Lucy? Um, I just have a quick question on this uh, property tax that we had gotten approved. Talk into your mic, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, this uh, property tax rate that we had approved, that 0 .006 for the street fund, is that going to be combined with this rate that we have so it's all going to go in one one pot? Yes, ma'am. That dedicated source, uh, since, it, since it was dedicated by council to specifically only be used on streets, that could actually be, I mean, we, we, you would see it in the revenue is two different line items, but we would keep that in the same fund since it is a dedicated funding source for streets only. Thank you. Harry? I like the part where you talked about being a dedicated fund that could only be used for street because I've heard a lot of citizens in the last couple of weeks uh, think that we're just taking money and it can be used for whatever. So when we, if we make this decision and it's passed as an ordinance, that part I hope will be in there that we can say, hey, it goes into a separate fund that can only be used for road maintenance and road construction. Yes, sir, and, and I know Teresa has been looking at this some as well too, and, and unfortunately she's not here today, but I believe there's state law that also has it restricted as well too. So uh, it wouldn't only just be in our ordinance, but I believe for us to be able to pass an ordinance to to collect a fee such as this and name it a street use fee, that uh, there's state law that restricts the use of those funds as well too. Thank you. Tom? So Harry touched on that, and I think we'll roll this one over to Brandon. Brandon, there's a couple of people here that brought up the fact that they thought there might be some legal issue of putting a fee on our water bill. Can you expand upon that? I know we've kind of given you a little foreshadow that question was yeah, coming. Yeah, so the way that the both the administrative code and the water code 
define a water and sewer utility. It has a whole laundry list of entities that are encompassed in that, but it actually excludes municipal corporations. So uh, I believe it could be on the, the water bill, but the other point about the, the commingling the funds, we want to ensure that it's not a revenue generator that exceeds the cost of the program or providing those services. Otherwise, it could be an author, unauthorized tax. So um, so long as we it, there's a reasonable basis for the fee, then, then we're good there. And my summary on this, just, you know, we're all throwing out opinions on this. I love the fact that nobody escapes this. All right. Everybody pays, everybody shares, and there's no way around it. And I think if all of our tax structures were based like this, we would never be in this type of situation. And so I'll be the first one to say I, I like the way this thing's going. I don't think it's a, a burden, but I do like the fact that you have already established a process if there's a grievance in here to pursue. But I'm certainly open to anything further, and I'm very encouraged by the process. Tommy? I, I'm going to echo what Karen said uh, much earlier in the conversation. I do like the concept. The, the timing is of question to me because of everything that's going on. Um, I don't know how we deal with that other than say we're going to bring this back six months, a year, whatever. I don't know what that is. But the timing, uh, at least for me, there's um, it just doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right to me. And I want to chase a rabbit just a minute, and this is going to be a real chase and a rabbit. Shane mentioned signals, and there has been an issue that has arisen, and I'm not going to go down this path because I think it would be far more appropriate at the discussion of the CIP. But there has been a, 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 a signal that has been mentioned to be removed that I think we need to discuss that. But you mentioned signal, so I wanted to throw that out. I'm, I'm thinking the more appropriate time to talk about that is when we talk about the CIP later in June. No, I tell you what we need to do, and we'll talk about that in a minute with Shane, not right now, I think, Tommy, because I think the idea was that it was announced that that traffic signal was going to be pulled today, that temporary light was going to be pulled today. So I think the issue is we need to talk to Shane outside this meeting today and say there's too many people who are opposed to that temporary light being moved from Knickerbocker and Twin Mountain. And we need to leave it there. And then, then at some point go ahead and get that put into the CIP, but we need to address the issue of not pulling it right now. Well, I think it's so, a, the, the, the signal is in the CIP. We just need to find the... Uh, instruct the staff to find the funding so again that's another another day another discussion but when you said signals a minute ago it triggered my t triggered my thought process so, um, so if they're out there moving it now stop them <laughs> they're not they're not moving it they're uh, they just bagged the bagged the heads there there's a process for moving even temporary signals and so we were we just started that process the trailers are still there so there's a lot of opposition to it we'd like to see it stay there for a while and we'll deal with the CIP later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Separate or from speed. this. Speed. Separate yeah. from this. Yes. Yeah. I th I think that there might be some people in the audience today who wanted to add comment on this issue. If you are here for that purpose, uh, please come forward. State your name, your um, uh, district, city council member in your district, and offer your comments if you are here. Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you.